All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, we will be having Dr. Holder Haynes. Uh, she's an associate professor in surgery and wears many different hats. And she'll be talking about medical evaluation uh, in bariatric surgery. OK, good morning. Uh, good to see so many of you here in person and online. Thanks for taking time out of your Saturday to be here with us. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the medical evaluation for our bariatric patients. Um, I have no financial disclosures. And uh, we're going to um, talk about the indications for bariatric surgery, the contraindications to surgery. Um, and hopefully, you'll gain an appreciation for the importance of the interprofessional approach to evaluating our patients. Uh, so, as has been previously stated, um, obesity is a complex disease, and so a lot of our patients may have associated uh, medical conditions that can affect their risk for surgery. So we um, very uh, intentionally take a very uh, multidisciplinary and multimodal approach to decrease the risk of surgery for our patients. Um, so you may be familiar with the obesity classification. Um, the patients that we tend to treat have a BMI above 35, and uh, the severe obese, severely obese patients um, can be further classified into uh, mild, moderate, um, and severe, um, or se very severe. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk now about the indications for surgery. So uh, these are NIH criteria. Um, so to be a candidate to be considered for surgery, you need to have a BMI over 40 without obesity, sorry, without obesity-associated medical conditions, or you need to have a BMI between 35 and 35.9 with associated conditions. And um, more recently, um, we have uh, given consideration to patients who have a BMI between 30 and 34.9 uh, who have uncontrolled diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Um, in addition to the BMI criteria, we want to make sure that our patients have an understanding of the procedure that they're interested in, uh, that they have realistic expectations of what surgery can provide, and that they're um, committed to behavioral change. Um, on the right, these are some of the medical conditions that our patients have, um, in, which include diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, reflux, fatty, acid, fatty liver disease, um, hyperlipidemia, elevated intracranial pressure, and lower extremity edema. And these are just some examples of the most uh, common conditions that we see. So in terms of the contraindications, um, there are very few um, absolute contraindications to surgery. Um, a lot of these are relative, and we try to uh, optimize and uh, risk stratify our patients prior to surgery um, in order to uh, make them uh, appropriate surgical candidates. Uh, but among some of the contraindications that we encounter are severe uncontrolled pulmonary hypertension, unstable coronary disease, severe co coagulopathy, ongoing substance abuse, eating disorders, um, noncompliance with medications or recommendations from other physicians. Uh, sometimes a patient is just an unacceptable anesthesia risk. Um, and we don't see many of these patients. They tend to uh, self-select out uh, for consideration for surgery. Uh, we sometimes run into patients with intellectual impairments, and we'll have to do additional evaluations uh, to see uh, how we can best help them uh, prepare for surgery. Um, active cancer treatment is a contraindication. We'd like our patients to be about six months out from any uh, cancer treatment before we'll consider them for surgery. In the case of the sleeve, I always, um, or we always ask our patients whether they have uh, GERD, and we ask them how severe those symptoms are. And if they're very severe, uh, then that's a relative contraindication to performing a sleeve gastrectomy. In the case of the gastric bypass, um, Crohn's disease is a relative contraindication as well, as well as uh, severe anemia. So we take a very uh, detailed history on our patients. We do, of course, the uh, routine um, history and physical, but in addition, um, we collect information such as uh, waist circumference and uh, neck circumference. Um, I always uh, broach my initial discussion with a patient with um, a discussion about their weight history and what their um, 
weight loss goals are, uh, when they started gaining weight, and what they believe might have contributed to, to their weight gain. So the weight history is really important, and that just helps to open up a discussion with your patients, as one of our previous speakers uh, mentioned. We also ask about their diet history, any weight loss medications that they've taken. Um, we ask about their procedure preference, as well as uh, their expectations that they have um, of their surgery. Their functional status is really important. You want to know if your patient is wheelchair bound, uh, because that patient is less likely to have um, really successful weight loss. But again, success in the eyes of the patient is uh, very different. But it's good to know their functional status. Uh, we ask about their DVT history. Um, and this is also uh, really important, um, their social support. Uh, we have uh, team meetings, and uh, we find a lot of times that the social support that a patient has uh, can affect their compliance with uh, recommendations uh, and their ability to um, achieve success uh, following surgery. So the social support is really important. And the psychiatric history, very critical. And we also give all of our patients a sleepiness score. We give them a questionnaire at the initial visit, and that asks them questions like, uh, you know, do you fall asleep watching television or uh, driving or in a theater or sitting quiet for too long? So uh, we score them um, from zero to eight, and based on that, we uh, make a determination whether that patient um, has a, a sleep apnea, an elevated sleep apnea risk, and we'll refer those patients for an evaluation. So we do several um, consultations. Um, at a baseline, all of our patients see uh, the dietitian and uh, the behavioral psychologist. We offer prehab with the PM&R department. We order uh, baseline labs. And um, if indicated, uh, we like some of our patients to lose a certain amount of weight prior to surgery if uh, we uh, deem that uh, their weight makes them um, an unacceptable risk uh, for surgery. Uh, we also encounter patients who are not interested in, in surgery at the time of their initial visit. And so we'll refer those patients to our colleagues in internal medicine uh, for medical weight loss. Um, so those are the baseline consultations. Um, in addition, we um, sometimes send our patients to sleep medicine, cardiology, endocrinology, GI, uh, hematology, nephrology, and psychiatry. So you can see it's uh, quite a list. Um, Next, uh, we, we will talk about the procedure choice, right? And um, I always ask the patients, um, along with their weight history, what procedure they're interested in. Um, again, this just helps to open up the dialogue. Um, most patients today prefer the sleeve. That's the most common operation. Uh, unfortunately, there's still a lot of stigma associated with the gastric bypass. Uh, so most patients coming in to see us prefer to undergo the sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, but it is a shared decision. Um, I um, hesitate, and we hesitate, to necessarily push patients towards a particular procedure um, unless there's an indication. So if someone has a, a prolonged history of uh, poorly controlled diabetes or they've been on insulin for over a decade, a gastric bypass or one of the uh, malabsorptive procedures might be a better option for that patient. Uh, but it's definitely um, a shared decision. And uh, we also consider uh, the patient, of course, right? Uh, so we want to uh, evaluate their surgical risk, um, their likelihood of compliance, um, their tobacco use history, all right? So um, for example, uh, we sometimes see very young patients who are off to college or off to professional school, and uh, th there's a high likelihood that they won't follow up with us after um, surgery. Uh, so it's better to offer them uh, more of a restrictive operation than, than a malabsorptive operation. So it's, it's very um, individualized. Uh, so in terms of some special um, considerations, uh, we're a quaternary um, um, specialty uh, uh, hospital. Um, and so we see a lot of complex patients, um, and we see uh, patients who require uh, heart transplants and liver transplants, kidney transplants. Um, and the LVAD patients in particular, um, you know, pose uh, quite a risk uh, undergoing anesthesia. So we will um, engage um, our anesthesia colleagues uh, to see those patients prior to surgery so that uh, we have all the equipment and uh, uh, specialty professionals needed uh, to safely get those patients through surgery. 
Um, we often see patients who have a very high hemoglobin A1C prior to surgery. And um, it, it's, it's tempting to say, uh, well, your, your hemoglobin A1C must be below a certain number prior to surgery. But we also have to weigh that against the likelihood that their blood sugars will improve with surgery, um, um, as well as their hemoglobin A1C. So um, we, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. Um, we like all of our patients to use um, their home CPAP machine, um, especially for patients with uh, severe um, sleep apnea. Um, those patients uh, at baseline have um, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, and uh, when you add narcotics to that, it can um, result in um, severe uh, morbidity for the patient. Uh, so we like our patients to bring their home CPAP machine. Um, we perform a um, DVT risk calculation for all of our patients prior to surgery, and uh, we will um, prescribe a home DV DVT uh, chemoprophylaxis for those patients as needed. Uh, so in conclusion, um, our, our patients um, have associated medical conditions that make them higher risk, and um, we work very closely with our colleagues to get them uh, ready for surgery. Um, I really appreciate the multidisciplinary approach and the colleagues that we have in our, in our department. Um, their input is, is very important in uh, improving the safety of our patients prior to surgery. And uh, thirdly, um, it, it is really important to include the patient in the discussion. You never want them to feel that this is an operation that's being done to them. Um, so um, including their, their preferences and sharing your knowledge to help them make the best decision is, uh, is key. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Sarah Malki. Uh, she is going to be discussing the nutritional evaluation of our patients. All right. Thank you, Dr. Holder Haynes. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Dr. Holder Haynes mentioned, I'm Sarah Malki. I'm a registered dietitian and I'm the bariatric program coordinator here at Baylor. So today I'll be talking with you. Uh, about the nutrition assessment of the patient with metabolic syndrome. And this talk is specific for patients who are coming through our program and intending to have bariatric surgery. I don't have any disclosures. So registered dietitians play an important role within the multidisciplinary program, and they'll often see patients several times um, in the preoperative period. Uh, most insurance companies require the patient to see the dietitian at least three times prior to their um, bariatric surgery, or they may have um, certain other requirements um, to see the dietitian prior to surgery. Dietitians also participate in multidisciplinary discussions to offer insight to the team, as Dr. Holder Haynes was mentioning, regarding patients with potential nutritional issues, any red flags we need to discuss, and offer potential solutions such as um, perhaps additional counseling sessions. Maybe they're just not ready after the three standard sessions. Um, most bariatric dietitians are ASMBS integrated health members, and this offers us a lot of um, benefits, including access to a nationwide community of dietitians to collaborate with um, and stay up to date with best practices, as well as other industry reps who help provide our patients with additional, additional resources, um, such as uh, help with the multivitamins that they'll require after surgery. And here at Baylor, we don't charge patients for their dietitian visits. We want to encourage our patients to be engaged with the program, um, and this helps us to optimize our patients' retention, engagement, and program compliance, which is huge. So during the patient's initial assessment with the dietitian, we'll start by obviously gathering necessary historical information. We'll discuss the patient's weight history, factors that impact the patient's weight, such as their physical activity level, their family history, um, any history of pregnancies, factors affecting their stress level, um, just anything we need to know about the patient prior to kind of getting down to the nitty gritty. And we'll talk about their expectations and goals for surgery, what is motivating them to have surgery, how much weight do they expect to lose, and whether or not these are realistic expectations coming into the program. 
Obviously, we'll discuss the patient's past medical history, their previous diet and weight loss attempts, um, any medications they're taking, including vitamins, herbal supplements, um, anything like that. We'll also talk about any dietary restrictions the patient may have. Um, this could be due to allergies, intolerances, preferences, cultural considerations. We want to know um, kind of what we're dealing with when we, we're talking about diet with the patient. And we'll assess for any food insecurity to make sure the patient has affordable access to food. It's really important to know um, what your patient is going through on a socioeconomic side before we start discussing food and what they um, can accommodate. And then we'll conduct a diet recall by asking the patient just walk us through a typical day. What do you normally eat and drink in a day? Um, who does the cooking? Who does the grocery shopping? This is really important because the, if the patient is not in charge of, of these things, then we may ask that they bring that person in so that their support person can also receive counseling as far as um, how to grocery shop and maybe how to prepare healthier alternative meals. Um, and we'll ask, what time do you wake up for the day? What time do you have your first meal for the day? How much time is in between their meals and snacks? What type of beverages they're drinking with their meals? Do you skip meals? Why are you skipping meals? Um, do you eat when you're bored in front of the TV? All these little things we need to know so that we can help the patient with where they're at. So after reviewing all of this important um, relevant history with the patient, then we'll kind of start going over the basics of the surgery, what they need to know, um, set realistic expectations, make sure they fully understand the entire journey that is to come. And then we'll review the anatomical changes for each procedure and kind of discuss the nutritional implications of these changes. We'll talk about dumping syndrome, what causes it, how to avoid it, um, review Again, expected weight loss outcomes to make sure that the patient is realistic about what to expect. And then we'll discuss some of the basic post-op dietary changes and behavioral changes that will occur so that we can start working with the patient to make some of these changes prior to surgery so that it's not so much of a drastic um, change once they do have the surgery. So some things that they may want to start working on is increasing their hydration, reducing their um, sugar-sweetened beverage intake, such as soda, juice, sports drinks, things like that. We can start working on chewing their food more thoroughly, eating more slowly, not skipping meals, um, reducing the amount of time between meals, uh, reducing their coffee and alcohol intake. We'll talk about the vitamin and mineral supplementation requirements. Um, and expectations to make sure that they understand this will be a lifelong commitment. Um, and then we'll start to talk about the, the basics of a healthy diet. So some of these patients never really received foundational knowledge of basic healthy nutrition. We don't get a lot of that in our, our regular schooling. And so we'll talk about, um, you know, basic food label reading skills how to assess what is the serving size, the different types of fats, amounts of sodium, fiber, added sugars, um, and how to interpret an ingredient list. I think it's also important to assess what access they have and tools they have at home. Do you have measuring utensils at home, measuring cups, to determine how much food you are eating um, to get an idea of your portion sizes at home? Um, and then we'll kind of review the, again, the basic concepts. This is a, a healthy preoperative diet, um, which is particularly helpful if they have a preop weight loss goal, especially. So we'll want to discuss making half their plate fruits and vegetables with a focus on whole fruit instead of juice. Um, obviously, we want that added fiber bene benefit. Um, a quarter of their plate to be allotted to grains with a focus on whole grains versus refined. We'll emphasize the importance of protein. Um, and discuss how important protein um, intake will be after surgery so they can start working on that before. Um, and suggest that they consume for some form of dairy for the calcium, which does not necessarily have to be included in the meal, and there's lots of different um, types of calcium uh, or dairy that they could consume. 
And we'll also talk about foods to limit, including those high in fat, sugar, sodium, um, and those things. And obviously, this preoperative diet will look much different from their post-op diet, um, which would be discussed with the patient in later sessions with the dietitian. And as mentioned before, um, previously in this, in this um, symposium, we want to make sure we're setting SMART goals with the patient. So at the end of every nutrition appointment, we'll work with the patient to set two to three SMART goals. And so they should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So most of these patients are um, used to making drastic changes in their eating and behavior um, in an effort to lose weight. So they're used to these crash diets kind of a thing. So we want to focus on making small, realistic changes in order to foster healthy long-term habits, in order to reach that long-term goal. And so some examples of these might be, if you're not exercising at all, let's start exercising for 15 minutes a day. Or reduce your soda intake from six sodas a day to two sodas a day before the next time we meet next month. Increasing your sleep from four, to four hours a night to six hours a night, or logging a food diary. I really like, um, someone mentioned a picture diary. I like this app, it's called Eight, A-T-E. It's a picture diary which um, also includes your emotion at the time that you're eating. And so this is really useful to be able to show your clinician, this is what I ate, this is why, this is how I was feeling at the time or um, reducing intake of fast food from three times a week to once a week. Just some of those really specific goals that the patient can work on rather than just telling them, I want you to lose 10 pounds before the next time we meet and not equipping them with the tools um, to make that happen. So postoperatively, most patients will be seen by the dietitian in our program at um, six weeks, and then around three to five months post-op, and then just as needed um, or as desired by the patient or how the clinician feels. Um, these are times when major changes in diet take place or when the patient may be struggling with their diets or behavior changes, and so it's really important to follow up and assess how things are going. The dietitian will work with the patient to assess how well they're adjusting and help to troubleshoot any problems. And then during the post-op period, you'll continue to work through those SMART goals with the patient, although they may look different and need to be adjusted. And so in the event the patient begins to experience weight stagnation and is feeling discouraged, help them focus on their non-scale victories in order to highlight all of their hard work up to this point and encourage them to continue with their healthy learning behaviors. I think it's really important to focus on not the scale, but what have you accomplished up until now that is going to continue to motivate you to want to continue. Um, if the patient begins to experience weight recurrence or weight regain, then we'd want to assess for any backsliding in behaviors, work through their triggers, and come up with any solutions. I like this article because it highlights the importance of dietitians um, in a successful bariatric program. I think all successful bariatric programs should include a dietitian. The study had 1,680 participants aged 20 to 70, and their BMI was measured before surgery and at least one month after surgery. They found that participants who attended significant diet counseling had significantly higher proportions of at least 5% reduction in BMI and participants who saw the dietitian two or more times were significantly and independently, as, independently associated with a BMI reduction of at least 5%, which was adjusted for confounding variables. And this study specifically highlights the importance of post-op follow-up with the dietitian. This was a retrospective analysis on patients who underwent bariatric surgery and were followed up either by a surgeon alone or by a surgeon and a dietitian for an initial post-op visit the initial post-op visit uh, was defined as being within two to six weeks um, after surgery. And so the patients who followed up with the dietitian in addition to the surgeon had significantly fewer readmissions due to nutrition-related issues, significantly more favorable three-month change in serum thiamine, HDL, and triglycerides, and this group also showed a trend in lower number of minor complications. 
However, in the study, there was no significant differences in percent excess weight loss at any time um, points after surgery. And so I hope after this talk, um, you know, if you didn't already know how important dietitians are in your program, you'll know that registered dietitians are essential members of any successful program. They play an integral role within the multidisciplinary team. We evaluate, counsel, and support bariatric patients through all phases of care and provide insight and advice to the providers. And finally, integrating dietitians in your programs will significantly improve your patient outcomes. Thank you. and expertise to everything she does. And I'm not sure 15 minutes is enough to talk about what you do, but Dr. Brown is going to talk about the uh, psychological evaluation. Thank you, Dr. Holdrains, for that introduction. And I will certainly try to cover the entire psychological evaluation in the 15 minutes. All right. So my primary role within, within our clinic is to conduct the psychological or behavioral health evaluations prior to metabolic or bariatric surgery, and so that is the topic of this talk. Um, again, I have nothing to disclose. <clears throat> All right. So over the course of the next 15 minutes, I'll begin by describing the purpose of the pre-surgical evaluation um, before outlining the components of the evaluation and possible outcomes. And finally, I'll highlight common areas of concern and contraindications for surgery. So as we begin, I think it's really important to keep in mind the biopsychosocial model. So it can be applied, obviously, to health generally um, and to obesity more specifically. Um, working as a multidisciplinary team really allows us to gain a more comprehensive view of a patient's health and factors, biological, psychological, and social, um, that one, may have caused, exacerbated, or maintained their weight, um, and two, are likely to impact post-operative outcomes. So taking such an approach, in my view, is essential to providing high-quality patient care and developing the most appropriate um, treatment plan for each patient. So you may be wondering, um, as are most patients, why a psychological evaluation is a necessary component of the pre-surgical process. So a lot of patients will ask what their mental health has to do with their weight, why they have to see a psychologist. They're totally fine. They're not crazy. Um, so first and foremost, this psychological evaluation is required by most third-party payers and programs. So even if a patient comes into a program as a self-pay patient, um, they may be required by the program to complete an evaluation. Um, this practice resulted from NIH guidelines that were developed in 1991, specifying that well-informed and motivated patients should be selected carefully after evaluation by a multidisciplinary team with medical, surgical, psychiatric, and nutritional expertise. <clears throat> the psychological evaluation at the most basic level provides an opportunity to identify risk factors and barriers that may negatively impact a patient's ability to make behavioral changes and adhere to post-operative guidelines. Um, another less commonly cited purpose is to establish a positive and trusting relationship between the clinician and the patient. So that way, if the patient requires any post-operative assistance, they may feel more comfortable reaching out. They have someone that they, contact, that they can contact and feel comfortable um, communicating with. Um, all of the information gathered is used to provide recommendations to the patient and to the team um, with the ultimate goals of reducing risk and enhancing safety and post-operative outcomes. Um, in developing a plan and providing those recommendations, it's always helpful to highlight patient strengths. So if a patient has successfully quit smoking, for example, um, these skills may also be helpful in reducing emotional eating, and so we can really kind of um, capitalize on that. The evaluation may also provide many opportunities for educating patients and reinforcing post-op dietary and lifestyle requirements. Um, very importantly, the purpose of the evaluation is not to serve as a gatekeeper or a barrier or an obstacle that delays or prevents a patient from moving forward with surgery. <clears throat> So programs differ um, greatly in terms of the type of behavioral health provider upon whom they rely to conduct the pre-surgical evaluations, um, but insurance companies typically require the evaluator be a licensed mental health professional. And so this could be a psychologist, this could be a psychiatrist, it could be a licensed clinical social worker. Um, the provider may be embedded within the clinic, as is the case here at Baylor, um, or may be external to the program and serve more of an independent consultant role. Um, as this evaluation is very specific, it is recommended that the evaluator have specialized knowledge and training in obesity, eating disorders, metabolic and bariatric surgery, um, and weight sensitivity as well. 
So in our program, the evaluation itself is scheduled as a two-hour in-clinic appointment, so patients understandably are not super excited about that. Um, they first complete computerized psychological testing, so it takes 30 to 60 minutes really depending upon um, the patient. Um, and this is followed by a 60-minute semi-structured clinical interview. Again, really depends on the patient. Some of these take over an hour and a half. Um, both sources of information provide the basis for feedback and recommendations. Psychological, contest, or psychological testing is an important component of the evaluation, so research suggests that patients are more likely to disclose problematic behaviors in a questionnaire versus a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, between one-half and two-thirds of evaluators report including testing in their evaluation protocols, but the specific instruments used really vary widely. Um, on, this slides are, oops, on this slide are the measures that I typically administer to patients. So in addition to a broadband measure of personality, um, patients complete measures of depression, anxiety, alcohol use, and eating attitudes and behaviors. Um, given the prevalence of adverse childhood events and other trauma history in this population, a screening measure for post-traumatic stress disorder is also included. Um, and additional measures like the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the MOCA are administered on an as-needed basis. <clears throat> Notably, some instruments such as the MMPI-3 include indices of the validity of the patient's responses to test items. So scores on these indices are a useful source of information given the tendency of some patients to present themselves in an overly positive light um, or minimize psychological concerns to increase the likelihood of being cleared for surgery. Um, except for the MMPI-3, all of these measures are free to use and can be easily re-administered to, to kind of assess change over time. So during the second hour um, is the comprehensive diagnostic interview. So um, we talk a lot about psychosocial history. So where and with whom does the patient live? Do they have an abuse or trauma history? Um, I also cover educational and occupational history. So what is their highest level of education? Were they ever diagnosed with ADHD or a learning disorder that could impact their ability to kind of take in the information that we are trying to give them and retain that and apply that? Um, we talk about current occupational status. Psychiatric history is certainly another area that we cover, so I want to know about past and current psychiatric symptoms and treatment, as well as family history. Um, research suggests that, the bariat that bariatric patients are a psychiatrically vulnerable population, and so there's going to be a much higher rate of prevalence of, of mood disorders and things like that among this population. Substance use is another important topic, so I, I cover past and current use of alcohol, tobacco products, and recreational drugs. This gets very tricky with all of the CBD products and Delta-8 things out there these days. Um, we cover misuse of prescription meds um, with tobacco or marijuana in cases of regular use. We really kind of look at that on an individual basis. Um, patients may be required to quit and submit kind of a negative nicotine or a THC screen in preparation for surgery. Also cover eating behaviors, so we go over whether a patient has been diagnosed with an eating disorder, which is, which is not very common, um, and whether they've had any associated treatment. I cover current eating behaviors, so I cover emotional eating, binge eating, graze eating, and night eating. I'm really also interested in whether a patient is engaging in any sort of compensatory behavior, so misuse of laxatives or diuretics, self-induced vomiting, fasting, things like that. Um, stress and coping. Whoop is another important topic, right? So covering kind of current stressors and how are patients coping with that stress? Are they using eating or alcohol or sleeping as their primary coping mechanisms? Do they have social support? Who have they talked to about surgery? And how have those people responded? Are they supportive or are they saying that the patient is taking the easy way out and continuing to bring home unhealthful foods and things like that? Whoop. I don't, I don't even know how I did that. Um, and then health behaviors. So um, obviously we know about the links between kind of sleep and, and weight and, and health in general. So we talk about sleep, medication adherence, um, and physical activity. And that is not all. Um, I also talk to patients about what is motivating them for surgery. So, you know, are there reasons for, for wanting to have surgery primarily health-related, or are they really kind of focused on their midsection and getting rid of their, their stomach, um, or weighing what they weighed, for example, when they were in high school? Um, are they viewing surgery in a realistic manner, or are they viewing it as a fix-all that's going to cure their bipolar disorder and, and suddenly make their, you know, marriage, you know, main their marriage? 
Um, I talk to them about what their plans are for surgery. Do they know who's going to bring them to and from the hospital? Who's going to be around for that first 48 hours in case they need any help? Um, do they have a realistic plan for taking time off work or are they planning to have surgery and go back like the next day? Because some people will say that. Um, and then what are their knowledge and expectations of surgery in general? So this kind of covers areas related to ability to provide informed consent, because that's one of my jobs as well. Um, do they have a solid understanding of the procedure? Are they aware of the associated risks and benefits? Um, are their expectations for rate and amount of weight loss realistic? Or are they expecting to lose 100 pounds in one month? Because I have heard that. Um, so these are all areas that I cover within that interview. <clears throat> And then the outcomes, once that testing and the interview have been completed, you know, I give patients feedback within that same session. So there are three possible outcomes of the evaluation, and some programs and some psychologists like to use the, the traffic light um, as kind of a good visual representation of, of what these outcomes may be. Um, so the first is that the patient is kind of cleared for surgery. Um, and can proceed without additional requirements. So I would argue that this, at least in my case, is relatively rare. There are some programs where not a single patient gets through without um, requirements. Most patients fall within this yellow um, light category in which they may be deemed an acceptable candidate pending completion of certain requirements, and we can discuss what some of those might be um, on the following slide. And then there's a real kind of small group of patients who fall within this red light category. So based on the results of the evaluation, these are patients who are not acceptable candidates for surgery. The question in these cases is whether there's a possibility that they may become acceptable candidates in the future. Is it a no, not now, or is it a no, never? <clears throat> and so in these cases, patients are typically brought up for discussion at our multidisciplinary team meetings. So whether and how frequently these meetings are held are really program dependent. Um, our team, which includes the surgeons, NP, dietitians, psychologists, MAs, patient navigator, we meet twice a month, um, and our program coordinator, of course, as well. Um, the goals of the meeting are to discuss complicated cases and really make a determination regarding each patient's candidate candidacy for surgery. So again, if someone's maybe not a candidate now, what could they do to improve their candidacy um, and move forward with surgery in the future? <clears throat> so this is certainly not all inclusive, but here's a list of common areas of concern. Um, when it comes to mental health, concerns include suboptimally managed psychiatric symptoms or a need for treatment. Uh, so a patient who's reporting severe depressive symptoms and is not in any form of treatment or someone who's reporting severe depressive symptoms despite being on psychotropic meds. Maybe there's something that needs to be kind of adjusted there. Um, their first patient may be required to initiate therapy and or speak with their PCP about medication options. The second may benefit from a referral um, to psychiatry for medication optimization and then plus or minus therapy. <clears throat> Some patients present with issues related to substance use. Um, current use of tobacco products is a contraindication. We typically require them to quit at least six weeks prior to surgery. Um, patients who report regular use of alcohol and or recreational drugs may also be required to quit and or initiate therapy to develop alternate coping strategies. Um, for patients who are at, are at a particularly high risk for development of a post-operative alcohol use disorder, we offer um, what we call the Substance Risk Reduction Group, which was designed at the Cleveland Clinic to educate um, metabolic and bariatric surgical candidates about the risks of substance use after surgery, which are really quite specific, um, and to facilitate individual relapse prevention planning. Another area of concern, of course, is eating behaviors. So um, this may be a frank eating disorder, such as bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder. Um, more commonly, it's other problematic eating behaviors, so emotional eating, graze eating, night eating. Um, patients with a diagnosable eating disorder or regular disordered eating are typically referred for external treatment to address eating concerns and, again, develop alternate coping strategies to replace food or eating. <clears throat> Whoops. Um, and certainly in considering whether a patient is an acceptable candidate for surgery, we really need to take into consideration social and environmental factors. So are they in a safe and stable living environment or have they moved every few months and are currently like without power, for example? Um, does the patient have the financial resources necessary to eat three meals a day and to purchase the, the vitamins and the supplements? Um, do they have access to reliable transportation to and from their follow-up appointments? And I think in these cases, it's really important that we consider um, whether it's ethical to provide a patient with surgery if we know that they're unable to do um, what they need to do to be successful and safe after surgery. Not sure what I did there. Uh, 
I don't even see the slow lines. You were done. Were you done? No. No. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm not sure what I did. I have my notes on there. Ooh. Oh, there it is. It was just hiding. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so as um, Dr. Holderhand mentioned, absolute contraindications for surgery are very rare. Um, as, with most, as with most things, they tend to be program specific. Um, commonly agreed upon contraindications include any of the following within the last 12 months. So an active substance use disorder, a suicide attempt, and or a psychiatric hospitalization. Um, other common contraindications include diagnoses of schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia, a diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder, um, which is more commonly known as multiple personality disorder, um, and then eating disorders like bulimia nervosa that involve compensatory behavior are um, of particular concern. Uh, depending upon the severity, again, as Dr. Holderhaines noted, intellectual disability, um, particularly in cases where the patient doesn't have a solid support system um, or where the intellectual disability may impact their ability to provide informed consent could be considered a contraindication. But we certainly um, will typically require kind of further testing, neuropsych testing, for example, in those cases. So in sum, the psychological evaluation is an important component of the pre-surgical process. Um, it should not be viewed as a barrier or an obstacle, but just another opportunity for preoperative optimization. Um, patients may leave the evaluation with a better understanding of behavioral factors that may have contributed to their weight um, in an individualized and comprehensive treatment plan. So this could include referrals to psychiatry, therapy, or smoking cessation, just to name a few. Um, it's also my hope, certainly, that patients develop a relationship and a level of comfort with me. So again, this would enhance, hopefully, their willingness to seek um, support after surgery if needed. Um, I think the ability, we know, certainly, the ability to benefit from behavioral health support is very common, um, and behavioral health providers may therefore play a, an important role in the pre- and post-op care of MDS patients. Now I'm... Our next speaker, it's Dr. Angela Cortez. She's an assistant professor in our sports medicine department and also the associate uh, program director for our physical medicine and rehab program as well. And she will be talking about uh, physical medicine and prehabilitation and exercise medicine. All right, good morning. So again, um, no disclosures, sports medicine physician here. All right, let's start with physical inactivity. It's a pretty common thing. One, out of, one out, of, out of every four Americans are sedentary, sitting for more than eight hours a day. Not unusual for someone who works a typical desk job or is a full-time student, for example. Sitting is just part of what happens. However, sitting or physical inactivity is an independent risk factor for premature mortality and is, it is responsible for causing up to 9% of premature deaths worldwide. And not just any sitting time is bad. Prolonged sitting time incurs higher risk of mortality and has associations with increased risk for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. In contrast, replacing one hour of sitting time with a variety of activities, which can include gardening, house chores, or walking outside, is associated with decreased all-cause mortality. So we just mentioned physical activity, such as gardening and house chores. So what is exercise? Exercise differs from physical activity in that it, it is planned. I will exercise Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It is structured. I will do these two exercises on my Mondays. It is repetitive. I will plan to do this every week for the next three months. And it is purposeful. I am doing this because I want to improve my health. Ultimately, the goal of exercise is physical fitness. So what does physical fitness incur? Well, just as sedentary behaviors increase all-cause mortality, physical fitness reverses that. Exercise can decrease risk of cardiovascular disease, decreasing blood pressure, decreasing the risk of stroke, and protecting us from heart attacks and coronary artery disease. Exercise improves our glycemic control and may prevent the development of type 2 diabetes. Exercise can protect us from all sorts of cancers, breast, intestinal, bladder, kidney, lung, stomach, esophageal, prostate, endometrial, and pancreatic cancers. 
And lastly, exercise coupled with diet results in a greater reduction in body fat and preservation in lean body mass compared to diet alone. Now, there is a caveat. When it comes to obesity, adding exercise to dietary changes is only minimally beneficial for weight loss. Part of the issue is the length of time needed to exercise alone to burn one pound. For example, a 30-minute walk at three miles an hour in an average person would burn about 100 calories. If done daily for a total of 700 calories burned each week, it would take five weeks to burn just one pound of fat, or 3,500 calories. So, so, well, if exercise is only minimally beneficial for weight loss, then why do it? Well, we get back to the idea that exercise is for physical fitness. And, exercise, and fitness can matter before a surgery, including a bariatric surgery. When our fitness is optimized, we decrease perioperative mortality in those who are sedentary. Again, one in four Americans are sedentary. There are fewer postoperative complications, fewer 30-day readmissions, and a higher chance we return to our baseline and feel more ourselves four weeks after surgery. We know for a fact that anyone who fits the bill for poor function would benefit from improving physical fitness, specifically an, an exercise routine. Risk factors for poor function include anyone over the age of 70, those who are frail, in other words, those who have signs of age-related physiological decline, those who have poorly controlled chronic illnesses, um, like uncontrolled diabetes, and those, uh, those on chemotherapy and radiation, and those who are inactive, which, like I mentioned before, is many of us, and which the WHO defines as those who are meeting less than 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. And herein lies the exercise goals. Substantial health benefits in general and those planning for surgery arise when we reach 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week. In fact, the United States Department of Health and Human Services recommends exactly that for all adults. This graphic um, is from the Move Your Way campaign from the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion outlining these goals. On the left, it shows 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise to stay healthy. And on the right, it shows that at least two days per week should include some form of muscle strengthening activity. Now, if we are going to spend 150 minutes a week or 2.5 hours on aerobic exercise, we should probably ensure what we know that means. Aerobic exercise is a general term, but includes any activity that develops your cardiovascular and pulmonary fitness. It involves the sustained use of large muscle groups, with or without weights, that stimulate your heart and lungs. I tell people this means any continuous movement of your body, enough so that your heart beats faster and your breath starts to move. Exer exercises are examples such as brisk walking, swimming, dancing, bike riding, and using an elliptical machine encompass such activities. All right. Remember, exercise is planned, structured, and repetitive. And much like a prescription for medication, for example, take one tablet by mouth three times a day for the next five days, an exercise prescription broken down into frequency, intensity, time, and type allows for the necessary planning, structure, and repetition needed for a proper exercise routine. With regards to frequency, abundant evidence suggests that spreading aerobic exercise over three or more days produces consistent health benefits and decreases risk of injury from overuse. With regards to intensity, the general rule of thumb is to aim for moderate intensity, though noting that high intensity can produce similar benef benefits in a shorter time period. With regards to time, studies have shown that continuous and accumulated exercise produces comparable results or comparable effects on fitness. So a 30-minute versus a 60-minute bout of exercise can be considered, whichever works best for your schedule. And type is the aerobic exercise of your choice. Walking is typically the most accessible and easiest to start for beginner exercisers, but it can be a wide range of things that suit your interests and routine. All right, now I'd like to go back to what defines moderate intensity. Typically, I break it down into two different forms of measurement. The simplest is the talk test. So moderate intensity means where you are too winded to sing, but not so winded that you cannot talk. Yeah. Um, a more numeric way to gauge moderate intensity is via heart rate. So those who have smart watches or a heart rate monitor on them, 
The CDC defines that as 50 to 70% of your maximal heart rate. Um, and so using a Carvonin formula, you get 220 minus your age and 50 to 70% of that, and that's your target heart rate for moderate intensity. Now, an exercise prescription is not static. Even though our goal is to achieve 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise five days a week or 150 minutes per week, we can start at 10 minutes of moderate intensity three days a week and increase over time to reach our goal. So doing so allows for gradual increases in exercise, which not only increases compliance for be beginner exercisers, it decreases the risks of exercise. So although there are definite benefits to exercise, there are still also risks to exercise particularly musculoskeletal injuries, such as a flare of pre-existing knee arthritis or the development of an overuse tendonitis. Arrhythmia, especially in patients with underlying heart disease or history of arrhythmia. Heart attacks, keeping in mind that people with coronary artery disease are more likely to have an MI at the time they are exercising, but they are overall less likely to have an MI than those who just don't exercise at all. Sudden cardiac death, especially those with structural heart disease or arrhythmias that can move into VTAC or VFib. And then rhabdo, especially severe complications from rhabdo, such as renal failure. And bronchoconstriction, particularly exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, noting that regular long-term exercise can also prevent exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. Now, among patients with obesity, the most common exercise risk factor I encounter is for musculoskeletal injuries. Obesity confers a significant risk for the development of osteoarthritis of any weight-bearing joints, such as the knee, the hip, and the lumbar back. With this in mind, for those at risk for musculoskeletal injury, aerobic fitness that minimizes joint stress should be chosen in your exercise prescription. We call these low-impact exercises. So sprinting down a cement sidewalk in high heels is high impact. Things like water aerobics, stationary cycling, and even a, an elliptical machine can, can, be, can be considered low impact. But type of exercise can be almost anything. For those at risk of musculoskeletal injury, you wanna focus on low impact exercises, but your favorite, favorite salsa class, ballroom dancing, learning that new TikTok routine, or spending an hour vigorously cleaning your bathroom can all get you there. So in summary, all our knowledge and all our efforts get us to something that looks like this. A succinct exercise prescription that indicates clearly our goals of frequency, intensity, time, and type. A prescription with a goal of 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise weekly, tailoring the type of exercise to any musculoskeletal conditions one might have with exercise, with an ultimate goal of countering the effects of common sedentary behaviors, in optimizing our physical fitness before surgery and our overall health. All right. Thank you. Do you utilize medical meal replacements um, pre or post surgery? And then for the evaluation, medical evaluation, I had some questions regarding what labs you guys draw. Um, obviously, on patients who have had. Um, uh, like the bypass, you need to get um, way more labs. But for restrictive procedures like the sleeve, um, what types of long-term, what types of labs do primary care physicians need to be um, aware of that these patients need to get drawn at least yearly? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'll answer the nutrition-related question first, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, we do not use medical meal replacements in our program. However, Postoperatively, we do encourage the use of protein shakes because a lot of these patients do struggle with their protein intake after surgery. And so um, I don't want to call it a meal rep replacement, but more of a tool in order to reach their protein goals. Uh, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Oh, about, oh, about the labs. That's in an upcoming talk. But. Um, <laughs> But um, we like to uh, check all the B vitamins, uh, zinc, um, CBC, CMP, uh, hemoglobin A1C. Um, I'm going to outline all of them in our talk. But we like to do those um, depending on the procedure um, at, a, at every three month or every six month frequency um, during the first year um, and then mm -hmm. annually after that. Any other questions? 
So I have a question for Dr. Brown. Can you talk about um, some of the challenges that patients face after bariatric surgery? Sure. <clears throat> um, so that's a great question, and there are numerous. Um, certainly there are some associated uh, with mood. So we know that after bariatric surgery, a great majority of patients tend to experience an improvement in like depressive symptoms, for example. Um, but symptoms of anxiety don't tend to get better after surgery. Um, we sometimes see, though, so let's say depression, for example, within that first two years improves. That two-year mark tends to be a really tricky period of time for folks, and so that's when we tend to see um, maybe depressive symptoms increasing again. That's when we tend to see development of an alcohol use disorder, um, which is certainly an increased risk for patients who have had a surgery. Um, and you know, this this seems to coincide with this end of the honeymoon period, right? So they've they've typically, you know, weight has stabilized at that point and they may or may not be particularly satisfied with with the results. Um, so, so mood, alcohol use disorders, um, eating issues can continue to be a concern, um, or they may shift a little bit in the nature of the concern. So someone who has, you know, who's engaging in binge eating, for example, prior to surgery may not be able to eat an unusually large amount of food after surgery, certainly given the, the reduced size of the stomach. Um, but this may transition to graze eating, which is kind of frequent, unplanned, small amounts of food over time that can contribute to uh, weight recurrence, which is another issue, um, along with body image that, that can be concerns for folks after surgery. So. Um, those are kind of a lot of the, the common ones. Relationship issues can also be another concern. So we see um, a lot of potentially kind of jealousy issues in romantic relationships, things like that. So it really kind of runs the gamut. Anything that you might experience prior to surgery, you could probably experience after surgery. Again, my name is Ulubumiola Adinjoye. Thank you so much for the presentations. And this further emphasizes the importance of interdisciplinary approach to the management of these patients. I don't think any one physician will have that much time to discuss nutrition at that length or go over the psychological evaluation. So thank you so much. My own questions are first, you did mention patients' motivation for the weight surgery, physical appearance versus um, health reasons, how does that affect your eventual decision on whether they go forward for the surgery or not? And secondly, for those who are not able to afford some of their uh, the vitamins, does that mean no surgery? Or how, what other programs do we have for this kind of patients? Thank you. So one for the dietitian, one for the psychologist. So in terms of um, motivations for surgery, I mean, that's certainly something that I assess. I don't think that that would be a deciding factor in terms of whether or not they moved forward with surgery. I think for me, it provides helpful information in terms of whether there's body image disturbance that we might want to address prior to surgery. So if, for example, someone is very fixated on like their physical appearance and lots of negative commentary about their physical appearance and their weight throughout the evaluation, I may send them to, to therapy to kind of work on their body image prior to surgery because we know that that's a risk factor for, for disordered eating and eating disorders down the line. Thank you for those questions. So for the patients who are not able to afford um, the vitamins, as you mentioned, there are lots of different options for vitamins. Some of them are bariatric specific, um, like they're produced by companies specifically for bariatric surgery patients. And then, um, you know, we can find alternative options to use using over-the-counter formulations that are a little bit less expensive. So we would just work with the patient to come up with a regimen that maybe they have to take more than one pill, obviously, and kind of combine things in order to optimize the nutrients that they're receiving so that they reach those target levels that are appropriate for a post-operative patient. Dr. Cortar? Yeah, thank you. Samer Matar. This is a question for Dr. Cortez. I don't want her to feel left out. <laughs> so uh, sarcopenic obesity is, is, is increasing in interest among uh, different uh, healthcare providers. And uh, we tend to see this in a lot of our patients when we do body composition analysis uh, on them. And I wondered if, uh, and, and the reason that's important is as they lose weight, as you know, they lose a mix of fat and muscle mass. So uh, in your evaluation for patients, um, do you actually look for sarcopenic obesity? How do you manage that? And how much time should we give patients to get optimized from that point of view before surgery? 
So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. I, I, you know, typically I keep my physical exam pretty simple. I'm just making sure um, overall um, strength is within normal range. I've had some very rare occasions with people who are severely de deconditioned. So we meet more than one um, criteria for just um, poor outcomes. So not just sedentary, for example, um, they are um, physiologically frail. Um, in those cases, they might need a more tailored program. I'm oftentimes saying, okay, I need you to get to see aqua therapy first to build up some muscle mass um, and build up your overall strength. Um, you know, it, it, and so once we, in terms of would that um, limit, you know, my recommendations to move on for surgery, um, I, it, it, I would say it more lies upon if they have other chronic conditions um, like, like heart failure or something, that's really um, going to um, put them at risk surgically. But um, just I usually tell my patients that after any surgery, you're going to have a decline in your overall fitness. And so if we're trying to make sure that we're optimizing our fitness in a good place before surgery, we will still have a decline, but it would be at a better place than if you're starting lower and dropping down from there. So, you know, most people I see in the, in the clinic are, are, you know, almost as, as active as we generally can be, you know, you know, which can be some, somewhat sedentary as well. But I will get a few rare patients who are um, quite uh, decondi deconditioned. Dr. Brown, um, <laughs> I had a question. Uh, it seems that uh, socioeconomic status is something that is uh, highly influenced to an extent. I am curious in regard to the correlation uh, for post-op uh, behavioral and disciplinary um, trends that you see, and that being tied to socioeconomic status as well, um, post-op. So I'm, I'm not, can you, can you just rephrase yeah. that for me? Yep. Yeah. So the behaviors, the, the discipline um, post-op for these patients after surgery, uh, do you see that there's a trend to where it, patients are more compliant uh, based on their socioeconomic status? Um, <laughs> of course, that kind of ties into, you know, the um, options that they do have available as well. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I think certainly, like you said, there are certain options that may or may not be available for <laughs> patients that make things easier or less easy um, after surgery based on so socioeconomic status. Um, to be totally honest, I, in, in our program and kind of me being the only psychologist, I really primarily see preoperative patients and I don't generally see um, patients postoperatively unless they're, they're struggling. So I have limited, I think, anecdotal or even knowledge on the research of that area, unfortunately. So, it, it is a very tricky subject because I, I shouldn't personalize it, but I think about myself. So I have a high stress job. I have lots of, or, or I have more financial resources than the typical uh, patients, uh, but I also struggle uh, with behaviors. Um, so it's not, I, I don't know that you can necessarily state that um, your social economic status would dictate. Um, whether you can comply or not. But that was a question that I, that leads into a question I have for Dr. Cortez. How do you motivate your patients? Because uh, we all have great intentions, yeah. you know, to, to exercise and be healthy. Um, and it's, it's hard to overcome that iner inertia. Yeah, I, I mean, so in my history, I usually get an idea of what their activity level is now and in the past, what they've done in the past. What can be hard and what a lot of even, uh, you know, just the everyday person will attest to is like, I've had a gym membership and I've not gone in three months and I'm just paying them every month, right? So, so it's hard to get us started. So a lot of it is just um, kind of um, describing to the patient what physical activity could encompass. And, and another, um, so it could be a lot of different things. You could make it fun, salsa class, right? Dancing to your favorite tune at home, just making sure you're getting those minutes in, right? Getting to that moderate intensity level, able to talk but not sing. Then, you know, we're getting, we're getting our aerobic exercise in, in that way. Um, uh, I had another thought. I'm just, I just lost it right now. But um, uh, it, it, could, it could really be anything. I just made, made it sure that we're at moderate intensity, okay? Um, uh, those are the main things. Yeah. Yeah. But to answer um, the last question, I'm not sure that we can necessarily say that it's all um, socioeconomic. I mean, so, certainly social support, I think, is important. 
uh, but um, I'm not sure that the motivation necessarily to exercise um, is limited to a certain economic class of, of patient. Yeah. Oh, I guess the other thing I, I did want to mention is a lot of people, like I mentioned earlier, with obesity can have feels that things that they feel are barriers, like their, their knee hurts really badly, their back pain is really killing them, right? And I just make sure that they recognize that there are ways to get moving that aren't going to hurt, right? Because they're, you know, they're going to say, well, I tried to walk for a half hour and my knee just couldn't get me there, right? Well, let's try putting you know, some seated dancing, put on YouTube. There's some good stuff on there too, right? Or if you have a stationary bike at home or if you have a pool at home, right? Or if you have access to a pool, it's probably going to get you some moderate intensity aerobic exercise and it's less likely going to hurt you. And so just being aware of these things is, is knowledge is power in some ways. So. And Dr. Cortez, um, thank you for the presentation. I, I think, I don't know whether this is a question or just an observation, that one of the slides triggered jealousy. Um, the ones you're talking about, the benefits of weight loss, this very trim top gentleman and lady, <laughs> and then the dosing is moderate intensity. I don't think moderate intensity can get us there. Yeah. So maybe for something we can relate with, choose people um, we can relate with. Maybe those people look like high intensity. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I just went on to Getty in Images, and I'm just like, why don't I just exercise, you know? So they couldn't find me a good everyday photo um, that exemplified exercise the way I wanted it. All right, we do have some questions from the chat. Um, one of them is, uh, who manages the routine annual labs at your medical center for the uh, bariatric patients? Uh, so we manage it within our clinic. Um, um, usually the patients uh, see us or the nurse practitioner on a fairly frequent basis, and we have a schedule for post-op labs. Um, so either the physician or the um, nurse practitioner will order labs on our patients. So we manage it. Um, in the cases of um, uh, nutritional deficiencies, uh, where we can't manage them in-house, uh, we'll refer out to um, hematology, for example. But usually we manage it in-house. Uh, and then a question for Dr. Cortez. Uh, what frailty assessment do you think is most appropriate for this patient population? Um, yeah, I, there, there are um, standards, um, measurements that I don't um, know the full details to. Some of them can include like the get up and go test, so how long it takes you to get up and stand, that, that type of thing. I have, um, again, it's not common where I'm getting actually frail patients. Um, but there, there are standard mechanisms, um, and I just I don't have that um, uh, those um, tests on me right now. Uh, I think that's all the questions from the chat. Um, any other questions? <laughs>